So this morning, um, we're going to look at a, a man named Benjamin B. Warfield. Um, he was born in 1851, and he died in 1921, so he is the first theologian in our list who brings us into the 20th century, which we all know and love. I noticed in preparing this lesson, it occurred to me that um, we didn't plan it this way, but the first three theologians we studied were Africans, the second three theologians we studied were continental Europeans. The third three theologians we're studying were British and American. And the last three theologians we're studying are all Dutch, or Dutch American. So I, I just thought that was kind of interesting. But I think it does sort of show the way that uh, God worked in his church through the centuries in terms of the great leaders of the church. Uh, so this morning, we're looking at Warfield. And... Another thing, we haven't talked much about this, and probably we should have, but one of the main goals we, that Luke and I would have liked to have for this class is that after hearing about these guys, you would want to read some of the things that they wrote. Ideally, from my point of view, I think everyone should read something from each of these theologians. And what, uh, what John Piper recommends, and which I also think is, is a great idea, he thinks every Christian should choose one theologian and, and really study and master that person. And as Luke mentioned, uh, for, for John Piper, the theologian that he has studied his whole life is Jonathan Edwards. And I think that's good advice too. Um, so in terms of reading for Warfield, um, almost all of his stuff is in the public domain, so you can find it online. And we, I have on my website, reformedaudio.org, uh, I put a link there under Warfield. I have several uh, of his more popular things that I, th I think are some of the best things he wrote. You can download those as a PDF and read them, or uh, we've recorded them to audio that you can download and listen to them too. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that uh, if you're interested in, in a little more detail on, on Warfield's work. So, um, Warfield's family. War, uh, ben, Benjamin Warfield was born into a very influential family. Uh, his great-grandfather was Thomas, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's attorney general. And um, that man was a deist, and he supported Unitarians, but his wife was a devout Christian. And all three of their sons became Presbyterian ministers. Uh, Warfield's great-uncle married John Witherspoon's granddaughter. I don't know if you know John Witherspoon, but I think, if I remember, he was the only clergyman to sign both the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Um, and he was also the president of, of uh, Princeton Seminary for many years. Uh, Warfield's uncle was also a congressman, and he was the vice president under James Buchanan. So his family was very well connected politically and socially. Do I need to stay to the right more, Jesus? Okay. Okay. Um, the, the best known figure in Warfield's family in the church was his grandfather, Robin, uh, Robert Breckenridge, and that's who uh, Warfield's second name, uh, the B after Benjamin, is Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield. His grandfather was Robert Breckenridge, and he was a very interesting character. And this, I have this book of uh, essays on Warfield's life and, and thought, which includes one whole essay on his grandfather. Um, his grandfather went... His grandfather and two of his brothers went to Princeton College, and uh, Robert, the grandfather, was actually expelled from Princeton College after he got into a violent fight, and uh, he, he was a very kind of a, he, he wasn't a very good character when, when he was young, but he became, a, he became a believer, but even after that, he was very... Um, controversial and confrontational. He was always getting in fights and arguments and, and different things. And uh, so there was a, a funny quote I wanted to read here. It says, Some years after Robert came to faith, his mother heard, quote, that some persons doubted whether her son Robert had any true religion. Said she, I haven't the slightest doubt of his being a converted man. You ought to have known him before he got religion. <laughs> so, um, but... In terms of his personality, there ended up being quite serious tensions between Grandfather Breckenridge and Princeton Seminary. The Hodges at Princeton, there were some uh, sort of unfortunate 
public debates in newspapers and so forth and so on. And so uh, it, was, it was interesting that his grandson was chosen to succeed Charles Hodge as, uh, or no, I'm sorry, he was, he was chosen to su succeed uh, Archibald Alexander Hodge as the chair of, of theology at Princeton Seminary. Um, Archibald Alexander Hodge was Charles Hodge's son, and uh, one of the Hodge sisters remarked that it was, it was very appropriate that AA should be succeeded by BB. So that was a little bit about his family. Uh, he was born in Lexington, Kentucky on November 5th in 1851. He grew up in a very uh, devout and pious home. In, in his home, all the children memorized the Westminster Shorter Catechism by the age of six. After that, they memorized the scripture proofs for the Shorter Catechism, and then they memorized the Larger Catechism. Every Sunday afternoon, they, were, uh, they, were, they would spend time memorizing scripture. Now, Warfield, uh, as a young man, and even through college, was most interested in science. And uh, he, he collected uh, bird's eggs, he collected moths and butterflies, he studied rocks and minerals. He read Darwin enthusiastically, and his favorite books were uh, Audubon's volumes on birds and mammals in North America. He was so sure that he would go into a scientific career that he objected very strongly to having to study Greek when he was at college. Um, he entered Princeton College in 1868 as a sophomore at the age of 16. So that's quite remarkable because by now we're into a time where the, the sort of degrees and ages are, are more in line with what we're used to. So he entered at a, a very young age as a sophomore and he graduated three years later at the age of 19 with the highest honors in his class of anyone in his class at Princeton. He went to Europe uh, to, stu to pursue graduate studies in the sciences, and he surprised all of his family and friends while he was in Europe by sending a letter back saying that he had decided to go into the Christian ministry. Uh, he, he, following that, he, uh, he went to Princeton Seminary, and in 1876, he married his wife, Annie. And that was a very interesting and uh, significant situation in, in his life because um, when they were very early married, I've heard it may have been on their honeymoon, but it was very soon in their marriage, they were traveling together in Europe. And they were out hiking in the mountains, and they were caught in a violent thunderstorm. And his wife, Annie, had some sort of nervous breakdown that left her basically an invalid for the rest of her life. And so Warfield, even being sort of the, the great leader of the Presbyterian Church at that time, never traveled more than a few hours from their home as long as she was alive. So he didn't go to general assemblies. He participated in, in denominational things through the journals, but he, in fact, he was never even able to be away from home for more than a couple hours at, at a time. So he would go home throughout the day to care for his wife, and he cared for his wife very carefully and lovingly until she died. Um, and she died in 1916, so she, uh, she lived all until within a few years of his death as well. Uh, his first academic post, he was at Western Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania for nine years where he was a professor of New Testament, and following that, in 1886, he was called to succeed Archibald Alexander Hodge as, you can read it in your outline there, Professor of Didactic and Polemic Theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. And that's where he stayed and did most of his main work for 33 years. Um, he instructed, in that time, he instructed over 2,700 students, including uh, J. Gresham Machen, who you may, may know. And he taught until the end of his life. On the day he died, he taught his class, he went home, and had a heart attack, and he went home to be with the Lord. So he worked right up until the end. Um, he loved people. You know, what? Uh, some of these guys are, are interesting characters, and Luke talked about Jonathan Edwards, that he probably wasn't the most personable uh, guy, but Warfield really loved people. He especially loved children. He was never able to have any children because of his wife's condition, but he loved children. Uh, he, he valued missions very highly, the missions work of the church, and he was also uh, very strongly in favor of the cause of the freedmen who were the, the slaves that had been emancipated following the Civil War. Interestingly, his family had owned slaves. They were from Kentucky, and they were slave-owning families. 
Warfield said, and he wrote some very, uh, I think, some of the most perceptive articles I've read from that time period on the question of slavery. He said slavery is a sin, but it's, it's a complicated situation that when, you, when you're in a family that owns slaves, you kind of start maybe to understand some of the difficulties that it's not just so simple as, as a lot of people might think. Um, and, and he wrote some interesting things on that. Um, hey, Crystal. Uh, one student, one of his students said that Dr. Warfield was the most Christ-like man he ever knew. Uh, and, oh, can we, can we put the picture up? I have a picture of him. There he is. Uh, you can see he has a, he has a great beard. And uh, I think that's on the steps at Princeton Seminary there on the left. So he looks like a very kind man, I think. Thank you. Um, his works. He, although he, was, he succeeded the Hodges as the chair of, of basically systematic theology at Princeton, he never wrote a systematic theology, basically because Charles Hodge had already done it. And Warfield didn't think that he really could or needed to improve on, on Hodge's three-volume systematic theology. He did write about, as far from my count, he wrote about 15 books, but most of his works were articles. He wrote hundreds of articles in book reviews, theological journals. Uh, he made contributions to magazines, dictionaries, and encyclopedias. And uh, so most of the works that you would be familiar with if you read Warfield are collections of his works. There's several. Um, this is volume one from a 10-volume collection, which I know a few of you have. Um, and uh, let's see, there's this, this one is called Revelation and Inspiration. Uh, there's, there's a volume on Christology. There's a volume on the Westminster Assembly and its work. There's a volume. There's two volumes on perfectionism. I guess that was something at the time he thought he needed to deal with. There's uh, volumes of, of reviews, critical reviews of books and, and different theological studies. There's also a, a five-volume set. Um, which I think is a subset of the larger set. And then more recently, there's a two-volume set of his shorter works uh, that's available. This is volume one of that set. And these are much more... Po well, the ten-volume set is tough because um, the range of Warfield goes from extremely popular and accessible to extremely technical. And he was a high-level textual scholar. And so in this book alone... I mean, I've recorded some, a, one of these articles, at least one of the articles in this volume to audio, which I think is, is very helpful and accessible to any Christian. But there's others in here that are just uh, unbelievable, uh, just very technical, academic, uh, textual studies in theology. So in the shorter writings, the two-volume shorter writings, it's some of his more popular stuff. So if you're interested in, in getting a volume on Warfield, I would recommend this, this two-volume set. Um, he was, a, he, he, he was a master of a wide range of things. Uh, he was a master of New Testament. That's what he was a professor of in the first 10 years. He was also um, a very skilled textual critic. He was an excellent linguist. He was, of course, a very good systematic the theologian. And he was also a master of the history of doctrine. Machen said of Warfield that he thought he was one of the finest historians of Christian doctrine who was alive at the time. This book, Revelation and Inspiration, um, John Stott was asked what the five most influential books that he had read in his life were, and the first one he mentioned was this book, Revelation and Inspiration by Warfield. So um, he's, uh, he's best known for that, and that's what we're going to look at in a, in a couple of minutes. He was also the editor of the Presbyterian and Reformed Review. And I wanted to make a comment on that because I think it's an interesting situation. Warfield was internationally renowned. Even as a conservative, Bible-believing Christian, he did not uh, subscribe to the higher critical theories of, of uh, the Bible at the time. In fact, he fought those his entire life. Uh, and he believed that the claims of Scripture were objectively clear, that they were completely compelling, in his own words, logically final, that the arguments for the Christian faith and the Bible were overwhelmingly persuasive. But the theological liberalism that was beginning to be pervasive, especially in the seminaries, but also coming into the church, 
um, was, was very influential, and that's what Warfield wanted to fight. What he did is he founded the Presbyterian and Reformed Review as a forum to debate academically the modernists because he believed that the Orthodox Christian religion was fully able to take on the modernist theolog uh, theology in the public square. So he, so he founded the Presbyterian Re and Reformed Review, and, and these academics would debate this stuff there with men like Charles Augustus Briggs, who was at Union Theological Seminary. He did not believe that the Bible was inspired by God. He did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He did not believe in a substitutionary atonement, but he was a very influential man in the church. So Warfield took these guys on in this journal, and they wrote for over a decade back and forth. Now, I think his sentiment was correct, but I want to suggest that, unfortunately, I think it was a, a tactical blunder, because what happened is that at, you know, years afterwards, now these guys can say, well, look, we've been publishing in the, in the Presbyterian Reformed Review, which is one of the main publication, scholarly publications of the denomination. They were able to point to that and say, you know, you know our view, we don't agree with, with everyone else, but, but this is within the acceptable range of dialogue. And so that ended up being, um, I think, an unfortunate uh, decision on his part, but it was certainly uh, significant in the academic community at the time. So... Um, what Warfield is best known for was his defense of the inspiration of Scripture. It's certainly not all that he covered. He, he wrote on a huge variety of topics. But what he's best remembered for is his defense of inspiration. And so uh, that's what I want to look at for a few minutes this morning. If you look at your outline, I want to read the, the first quote there under systematic theology. He says, we hazard nothing, therefore, in saying that, as the condition of all theology is a revealed God, so without limitation, the sole source of theology is revelation. Okay, the only source of theology is revelation. Now, when I went back over these notes, I, I looked at that and I was like, that's so obvious, I, almost I highlighted that quote to delete it, and then I thought, wait a minute. It, it seems obvious to us, but you have to keep in mind uh, what was going on at the time. Here's a short quote he wrote in a review of, of uh, another, another uh, biblical scholar. He said, He who no longer holds to the Bible of Jesus, the word of which cannot be broken, will be found on examination no longer to hold to the Jesus of the Bible. Warfield says, if you give up the Bible of Jesus, you will lose the Jesus of the Bible. And that was the battle in his day, was for the nature of the Bible. Was it the Word of God or was it not the Word of God? And Warfield was convinced, and he turned out to be right, that once you give up the Bible as the inspired Word of God, anything in the Christian religion is up for grabs and it ends up falling by the wayside. So, the people who no longer held to the, to the Bible of Jesus were the, 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 the guys I mentioned, the theological modernists, and they were strongly influenced by a movement called higher criticism. Basically, the bottom line of higher criticism is that the, the higher critical scholars look at this book and they say nothing in the Bible can be trusted to be exactly what it says it is. We have to look at the historical record and the ancient texts and try to figure out what's correct and what we believe, and also compare it with extra-biblical results of archaeology and so forth. So, so for, for the higher critics, what is Christianity? What is the Christian faith? Well, they would look to the social situation. They would say, well, look at, look at the, the society in which Christianity arose. Or uh, they might look to human religious experience. They would say, what have Christians experienced? throughout the ages? What have they written of their experience? That will tell us what Christianity is. Or they would look at it in terms of evolutionary development. So they, they see um, you know, early uh, Israelite monotheism and, and then progressing steadily uh, from, a, from an angry God to a God of promises to a Savior, Jesus Christ, and, and Trinitarianism. So they see it as an evolutionary development. Um, 
Or maybe they see it as the voice of the church. They say, what is Christianity? Well, it's, it's what the church has set, said it is. Well, some of those things kind of resonate with us, but that's why that first quote from Warfield is important. The sole source of theology is revelation. And that was the challenge with which he met the higher critical scholars in his day. What was going on in the seminaries as a result of these trends was that the, the theology departments throughout the uh, 19th century and into the 20th were being changed into religious studies departments. So what was before the knowledge of God, we have a theology department, we have a divinity department where we go to study the revelation of God and, and know God into religious studies. Because we no longer, you know, we, 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 we can't trust the Bible. We don't know anything about a revealed God, but we can study the religions of the world and, and with Christianity among them as another religion. So that was sort of the, uh, the context in which he wrote. So what did Warfield say about how did he defend the inspiration of Scripture? He says that in the history of the church, there are only two views of, the, of Scripture, two lower views of Scripture that gained any influence. The first is rationalism. What rationalism does is it looks at the Bible and it says, okay, well, some of this may be inspired, but some of it's clearly not. So what we've got to do is we've got to find out independently which parts of the Bible are inspired and which parts of the Bible are not inspired. They want the, the, uh, the rationalists want to, want to say that uh, maybe the mysteries of the faith are inspired or um, the, the, they might say the thoughts and the concepts are inspired or the matters of faith and practice are inspired, but especially, especially matters of historical detail are not inspired. So one of the things that uh, actually Richard Williams used in his class, which I found very helpful, this was several years ago, but he drew a pyramid and he said, divided it into, into sections like this. And if you, if you think of the Bible in this way, at the bottom here, you have the words, the individual words of the Bible. At the top here, you have the concepts, the big overarching concepts. So God is love or uh, you know, ju justification by faith alone. And the question in inspiration is, where is the inspiration located? The critical scholars want to say, well, it's just the concepts that are inspired. The fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of Christ, the brotherhood of all humankind, the love of God, those concepts in the Bible are inspired. But the words themselves, the individual words of the text, are not inspired. So that's kind of the question, is where does inspiration uh, come here? And in rationalism, they want to distinguish the parts that are inspired from the parts that are not inspired. The second view that has come uh, influence uh, arisen in the church that leads to a lower view of scripture in addition to rationalism is mysticism. What happens in mysticism is that the person, the individual Christian, has some principle within themselves by which they judge the claims of the Bible. So um, maybe it's their enlightened reason uh, maybe it's the, the Christian consciousness, like their sense of Christianity as an individual, or perhaps they appeal to the witness of the Holy Spirit in their heart. But no matter what it is, it, it's a form of mysticism which subjects the Bible to some inner principle within the individual Christian. So these are the two movements. Warfield says that these are really the only two options that have gained uh, any traction within the church but he says they have, they have n neither one of these views has ever succeeded in replacing the, the faith of the church in the teaching of the church or in the hearts of Christians. He says, whenever, whenever you get five 
quote-unquote advanced thinkers together in one room, you will have at least six different views of inspiration. What is inspiration? Uh, he says they differ in every conceivable point except one. The one thing that they all agree in is that there is less of the truth of God and more of the error of man than we have ever thought in the past and what most Christians have believed. That therefore, here and there, the Bible may be safely ignored or openly repudiated. So they, they can't agree uh, what they can't agree what inspiration is. They can't agree to what extent inspiration guarantees the Bible is reliable. And they can't agree which parts of the Bible are true and which parts are false. But they all agree that the faith of the historic faith of the church and the inspiration of the Bible is not correct. Now, they themselves, these higher critics, introduce to us the fact that the doctrine that they all oppose is the well-defined church doctrine which uh, Warfield defends. And he, he makes three points about the church doctrine of inspiration. One, it is not the invention of an individual. There's not one person in the early church that you can say, you know, this guy came up with a theory of insp inspiration. It is the settled conviction of the entire church of God that the Bible is in the inspired word of God. It's not the invention of an individual. Also, it's not recent. He says it is the assured persuasion of God's people from the first church until today. And finally, it's not constantly varying with every new change in the thought of man. The Christian's faith in the inspiration of the Bible has been the same from the apostles' time down to our day. It's not constantly having to be updated depending on uh, the, the trends of intellectual culture. To, to encapsulate the church doctrine that, that Warfield is talking about, what the, the Christians have believed through the ages is that whatever the Bible says, God says. That is the doctrine of inspiration in a nutshell. It is God breathed. God breathed it out into the writers of Scripture. Um, and that at, at any point that we appeal to the Bible, we can do so with full confidence, knowing that that, that verse is inspired by God. Now, uh, the critics of the church doctrine also admit that this view is found in the very earliest church fathers extensively. They admit that it's, it's held by the late fathers. They admit that it's held by the reformers. They admit that it's held by the Puritans and down to the current times. So, um, and all of the creeds of the church affirm this church doctrine. It doesn't matter if they're Protestant or Roman Catholic. The Apostles and Nicene's creeds, the Council of Trent affirms the doctrine of inspiration. The Augsburgs and the Westminster and the Dutch Confessions all the great confessions of the church affirm the doctrine of the inspiration of the Bible. So, Warfield's uh, argument, positive argument for the inspiration of the Bible, he makes three points. First, is that we can read the Bible and we can see how Jesus and the apostles thought about the Bible itself, about Scripture. And we can see that when Jesus and the apostles quoted the scripture, they said things like, it is written, or the scripture says, or God says. And when they say that, that's it. That's the final court of appeal. There's nothing beyond that to which they appeal. So it is the conviction of the church doctrine of inspiration is also what Jesus and the apostles believed as we can read for ourselves in the New Testament. Now, as I said, uh, the critical scholars also concede that the church doctrine was the conviction of the New Testament writers. They admit to this, but they try to get rid of it. So, they say, um, well, whatever, for instance, for instance, they might say, well, whatever, whatever Jesus Christ thought about the inspiration of the Bible, we don't know because, because we only have what the apostles wrote. So we don't know what Jesus wrote, but we do know what the apostles wrote. Um, or uh, some, some of them might say, well, uh, or some of them did say, well, 
Jesus didn't really believe the doctrine of inspiration, but he was accommodating himself to the people of the time. You know, so, so basically the idea is that the Jews clearly believed that the Old Testament was inspired by God. The Jews also believed in the verbal uh, inspiration of Scripture. And therefore, uh, because they were in that cultural context, the apostles naturally held to the same view. And uh, so Jesus was just kind of accommodating himself to what everyone else thought. Um, but there, there's another interesting problem with that. I'd like to read the quote on the second, or the, the back of your outline. It's the third quote from the bottom. And this is a, this is a, this, this point that he makes here is a catastrophic disaster to uh, critical theologians. So I want to read it. And if you're going to remember one thing from this class, I would recommend remembering this point. Warfield says, This may be made plain at once by the very obvious remark that we have no Christ except the one whom the apostles have given to us. Jesus himself left no treatises on doctrine. He left no written dialogues. We are dependent on the apostles for our whole knowledge of him and of what he taught. The portraiture of Jesus, which has glorified the world's literature, as well as blessed all ages and races with the revelation of a God-man come down from heaven to save the world, is limbed by his followers' pencils alone. The record of that teaching which fell from his lips as living water, which if a man drink he shall never thirst again, is a record by his followers' pens alone. They have painted for us, of course, the Jesus that, that they knew and as they knew him. So this is a critical point for Christian apologetics because there are all sorts of theories about the real Jesus, starting from the 1700s, ranging from you know, Jesus, um, Jesus ha had an affair with Mary Magdalene, or, you know, Jesus was a homosexual, or there's even one scholar who said that Jesus didn't exist. The problem that these people have is we have no contemporary accounts of Jesus. We know nothing about Jesus except what we have in the Bible. So any theories like that are pure speculation. Josephus mentions I think in three occasions, Josephus mentions Jesus, the existence of the followers of Jesus. But we have no other eyewitness account of Jesus and what he taught and what he did besides what we have from the, the apostles. So when they say, well, you know, Jesus didn't really believe that view. He was just accommodating themselves to the time. That's just pure speculation. There's no basis whatsoever to suggest that. Um, So, Warfield says this is the teaching of the church, and it is the teaching of, uh, be, be, it's the teaching of the church because it is the teaching of Jesus and the apostles. And he says that uh, the church's view is sound for three reasons. Let's start over here. One, uh, I'm not going to write it down. It, it, one is that not every Christian's a scholar. If you have to have all this scholarly apparatus to find out what's reliable in the Bible or what's not, how can anyone but a, a very small few people be Christians and know what they're to believe about Christianity. Um, secondly, to, have, to be fully confident in our Christian faith, we have to be fully confident in the Bible for the same reason that I mentioned, is that we don't, we don't know anything about Jesus and, and what he did other than what the Bible has revealed to us. So we're dependent on that. And third, he says, we cannot, we cannot leave a trust of the Bible to a trust in the historical vindication of Christianity. This is what they want to do. They don't want to look at the Bible. They want to look at history and archaeology and so forth um, because the history that we have is also grounded in God's revelation. So Warfield says, think about this. Um, Jesus rose from the grave. or, or Jesus, Jesus was uh, born in a, in a stable in Bethlehem. Or Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the grave. Well, so what? The guy rose from the grave. What does that mean? I mean, what, what significance is that? It was very unusual, no doubt. But, but who cares? The only way we can understand that Jesus rose from the grave 
because he was the, the son of God who came to save us and that he conquered sin and death is because that's what we're taught in the Bible. God's word, his written revelation, explains the acts of redemption. And it is the acts of redemption that we trust in for our salvation. The historical events of what Jesus did in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. But we have no connection to those events to know how to rightly interpret them except in the Bible. And that was the quote immediately preceding the one I, the one I just read. I'm not going to read it now because uh, we're running low on time. But uh, th that's where he says that, basically. We, don't, we can't interpret, the, we can't give meaning to these redemptive acts without the revelation that accompanies them. Uh, the, the, one of the, and then one of the things I wanted to mention, one of the important doctrine, or one of the important aspects of this doctrine that Warfield uh, really spent some time developing was what is called concursus. So the question is, you know, uh, we know that we know that these words were were physically written down by by men, but if we believe that God inspired them, you know, to what extent? Is, uh, is, is man at work and to what extent is God at work. And uh, the doctrine which is implicit in the church, but I think really gets fully developed by Warfield, is that this book, it is not inspired in terms of dictation. These guys did not mechanically write down what they heard from God in the sense of dictation. But it's it's a matter of concursus, which is that the, the words of the Bible are God-breathed. They're fully given by inspiration of God to the writers, but also that the writers are fully human and fully engaged with their personalities and their context and their histories in writing down the things that they were inspired to write. So if you think of the doctrine of Jesus Christ, we say... Well, what's the, you know, is G Jesus Christ is God, but he's man, how is this? Well, we say, the church affirms that Jesus Christ is fully God, he's 100% God, and he is 100% man at the same time. Two natures and one person. In the same way, similarly, we say with the Bible that is, it is 100% uh, the words of God, so that it is absolutely reliable, and whatever the Bible says, God says, but at the same time, it is 100% the words of men and their personalities and their context, which God raised up for that exact purpose. Um, so that's the idea of concursus, which I think is uh, significant. And then finally... What comes out strongly in Warfield as you read his work on inspiration is that what he understands is that the reason the church believes in the doctrine of inspiration of the Bible is because the Bible gave us our life. The church understands and knows that the Bible gave it its life. And uh, I heard one story uh, about R.C. Sproul, that's my favorite story on this idea. I, and I'm getting this secondhand. If anyone has the footnote of where this story came from, I would like it. But as I heard it, uh, you know, R.C. Sproul got his Ph.D. in the Netherlands, and his advisor, as I understand, was a critical scholar who didn't believe in the inspiration of the Bible. And they would argue about this. And they, at a conference in the United States, they were having a heated debate and his advisor grabbed him by the tie and said, why do you insist on the inspiration of the Bible? And R.C. Sproul grabbed him by the tie and said, because it gave me my life. And that is the sense of the church. When the Bible, as the inspired word of God, is attacked, the church grabs the opposition by the tie and says, this gave me my life. You may not touch the Bible as the inspired word of God. Um, and that's what Warfield spent a good deal of his life and time defending. I wanted to give a little bit of an evaluation, talk about a couple of things, but we're almost out of time. There's three minutes. 
So uh, probably better if we have time for questions, if there are any. Does anyone have any questions about Warfield or the doctrine of inspiration? Yeah, Bruce. Yeah, um, the, I'm sorry, the question is, uh, how did Warfield interact with uh, Darwinian evolution? What was his evaluation of that? Um, he was sympathetic to Darwinian evolution in the sense of, I, I think he did believe in a, a very long time of the Earth. Um, one of the reasons I didn't address that today is because I found a link to a reference from Warfield that really, uh, there, there's a popular conception that Warfield was just a base, almost a full thoroughgoing evolutionist. But I found a link uh, that really undermines that and I didn't get to study it. So the short answer is he was, he was much more sympathetic to Darwinism than for, for instance, Charles Hodge. Um, but what the details of that are, I don't know. Are there any other, any other questions about Warfield or inspiration? Well, let me just make one quick point then in terms of, of a, an evaluation of Warfield. Um, maybe you can guess uh, what I might be critical of in Warfield, but since you've, this is the fourth class I've taught in this series, but it turns out that Warfield, I think, departed a bit in terms of his methodology. Um, he saw, Warfield saw that the evidence and the argument for the truth of Christianity was absolutely objective, it was clear, and uh, it, it was clear on the basis of what God had revealed in nature and in scripture. So he saw that. However, he incorrectly concluded that the unbeliever or the critic could be engaged with the claims of Christianity on the basis of appeals to the unbeliever's right reason. So he said the argument for Christianity is conclusive and we can engage the unbeliever in terms of neutral principles which they will accept to show them uh, the truth claims of the Bible. The other uh, result which was unfortunate is that when you accept the unbeliever's claims of intellectual neutrality, the result is that scripture ends up, oddly enough, even for Warfield, ends up being only highly probable. And I want to read a quick quote. Um, I mean, you, you would say, well, look, if it's so certain, if it's so logically final, then is it not certain? Why is it highly probable? But he says, um, an a priori possibility may be asserted to exist in the case of the Bible that a comparison of its phenomena with its doctrine may bring out a glaring inconsistency. He says, so, so, so it may be that the facts contradict the Bible. He says that's possible. He says, by all means, let the doctrine of the Bible be tested by the facts and let the test be made all the more, not the less stringent and penetrating because of the great issues that hang upon it. If the facts are inconsistent with the doctrine, let us all know it and know it so clearly that the matter is put beyond all doubt. And then two pages later he says, talking about the evidence for uh, the, the, the Christian doctrine, he says, of course, this evidence is not in the strict logical sense demonstrative. It is probable evidence. It therefore leaves open the metaphysical possibility of its being mistaken. But it may be contended that it is about as great an amount and weight as probable evidence can be made, and that the strength of conviction which it is adapted to produce, may be and should be practically equal to that produced by demonstration itself. So he says, well, with all these arguments that we have for the inspiration of the Bible and the truth of the claims of Christianity, we have to leave open the possibility that it could be mistaken. It's extremely probable that this is right, but it's possible that it's wrong. And I don't have time to get into details. We'll talk more about this at length in a couple of weeks, the Lord willing, when we talk about Cornelius Van Til. But the point is, Warfield unfortunately accepted the unbeliever's concept of abstract possibility. So the unbeliever says, 
Anything's possible, absolutely anything. I don't know anything ahead of time. I can't know it until I see the facts and see what the facts tell me. So you have to be absolutely open. It's, a, it's an abstract concept of possibility. The Christian concept of possibility is that what is possible is grounded in the plan of God. So Paul says it is impossible for God to lie. The scripture says, uh, and Jesus says, the scripture which cannot be broken. So the Bible claims that God cannot lie and that the scripture cannot be broken. It does not say, well, this is what we say, but check it with the facts. The Bible considers itself the highest authority. Um, as Luke talked about with Calvin, the Bible is self-attesting. It is the highest authority, um, or it, it ought to be the highest authority for individuals. Uh, not an appeal to facts which are a higher authority than God to which God is also answerable. So that's not, not much of, a, of an introduction, but just to, to whet your appetite for hopefully in a few weeks when we talk about Van Til. So um, I think we're out of time. I'm going to go ahead and close us in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for Dr. Warfield. Thank you for his uh, work and his vast output defending the truth of the inspiration of your word. Thank you that you gave us an inspired Bible to uh, teach us reliably and perfectly about what you have done for us in Jesus Christ, in his uh, coming to earth, being born of a virgin, uh, being God in the flesh, living a perfect life in obedience to your law, dying on the cross, on the third day rising from the dead, and interceding on our behalf at your right hand, and coming... Uh, to judge the world uh, on his return. We pray that as we enter into your presence for worship, that we would be mindful of these uh, great things that you have done for us, and we pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask all this in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen.